It's Friday the 13th, June 13th, uh, 2014. It's Mike Tabor and Anand Galavan, and we're at ICS, and we're interviewing Dar Alperovitz or Alperovitz. Alperovitz. And, um, and so, Dar, could you give us some background, uh, family background, why you chose to get into what you've gotten into, where you're from? Uh, uh, Racine, Wisconsin. Um, brought up in, you know, a small industrial town at those days, now a dying industrial town. Um, my parents were Eisenhower Democrats, middle of the road, but they were involved in community affairs. And, you know, my mother was involved in the Cancer Society. My father was involved in the temple and president of the, of the temple. And, uh, but very, you know, committed but not radical in, in any way. Um, I was a, a, you know, I, was, I played football in high school. <laughs> I was really good left guard because I had a 300-pound tackle next to me. <laughs> I can't imagine there were too many Jews. <laughs> too many Jewish kids. And, yeah, it was good. I was, it was fun because he was, he was powerful and I was very quick. It's called a pulling guard if you know anything about football. It's, you move fast. Uh, I went to the University of Wisconsin. Um, it was probably going to be either a doctor or a physicist or maybe a lawyer. Uh, I actually have a Bachelor of Science degree in American history, which is very unusual because I ran into the history department after I'd done all my, I was good at science and math and I love that stuff, but I ran into the history department at the University of Wisconsin, which was a very good unit. What year? This is, I went to, to Madison in 1954. Yeah, I'm 78 years old at this time, and so that's my age. And uh, I graduated, I went, William Appleman Williams was teaching there the radical historian. And he was just in his explosive um, creative period. And it was extraordinarily interesting and stimulating and I'd never understood any of that and, and um, began really thinking seriously about economics and history. So I was, um, I was registered in medical school and, and didn't go. I had, I had scholarships to Yale, Harvard, and NYU. I had a rip tilt into NYU Law School and I couldn't go. I just couldn't. <laughs> I just didn't, I didn't want to do that. I was playing out, you know, the, the nice Jewish boy could be a doctor or a lawyer, but I just couldn't do it. <laughs> so the, the guy who was the, his, another historian who was president of the university, Fred Harvey Harrington, a well-known historian, very good historian, got me a fellowship to uh, Berkeley at the very last minute. And I felt like I just, it was time for me to get out of Madison because I wanted to really think about this powerful stuff that I was hearing and learning. Just the beginning of civil rights activity in Madison, I was not heavily involved. 57, 58, yeah, little things. And I was, I was involved in the student union. I was student union president. Uh, I have a memory there, which is political. I think the only serious political thing I did in Madison, uh, look, um, Saul Lando was there at the time, we were friends, um, was uh, there was a, something called the Student Life and Interest Committee. and. As president of the student union, I was on it, and that was the, I don't know, advisory committee to the, you know, to the real power, the system, and the, the, there was a big fight over the LYL, which is the Labor Youth League, which was Communist Party, to, and there were two people, and the fight was the, the administration wanted to force them to, um, to disclose their membership list, which would have been a violation, you know, severe violation of any civil liberties that they had. And so we fought against that and we won. <clears throat> so uh, that must have been 1956 or so. You know, it was the kind of place where the dean of the, of the university was almost certainly a CIA guy uh, recruiting people to the CIA and uh, that, that sort of thing. Was that kind of a institution? Madison was, was a very liberal and his history department was spectacular. It was radical in many ways. Uh, but the university, the whole culture was, of the university was very liberal. So, um, and I have a memory of Pete Seeger coming to the University of Wisconsin. This is, you know, Pete Seeger, before he was Pete Seeger. This is in the 50s, maybe 56. And, you know, and probably in a, not in a classroom, but not in a big auditorium. Maybe you could get 200, maybe 100 people into the room, and that was not filled. Uh, and he'd been blacklisted, of course. He wasn't getting any gigs. So, uh, and all my friends knew that I was uh, the union the fight about the student league. And when he's saying, I'm sticking to the union, they meant my union. 
student union, so it's a memory from the past. But I don't. I wasn't involved in politics in any in, in any left or activist politics to any degree at the university. Um, I didn't know about that. I just learned about that kind of as I grew up at the university. So, but I was intellectually uh, powerfully stimulated by uh, Williams and a guy named George Mossy, who was an intellectual historian, a very good European intellectual historian. Um, so that's then I went off to Berkeley, and. I really just had to get out of Madison because the intellectual atmosphere was so powerful that I thought I better get back someplace else and think about what I've been with this young college kid basically. You know, I was 22, something like that. You know, what is this all about? And, this, and so I went, to, I, I went to Berkeley and did a master's in economics. Um, Minsky was on my committee, but I didn't know him. The, the, well, and now he's come into fame. He was, he was just another economics professor at that time. Um, so. The next, the next thing that happened is I got a Marshall Scholarship and went to England. What, what year? That must have been 59. Uh, the free speech movement, Mario Savio, that I'm No, no, this is all pre that. I'm, Operation Abolition, no. Uh, none of that stuff. No. Although Rob, Bob Kastenmeyer was important, we'll come to that, in the HUAC fight. He was one of the five guys who voted against HUAC, which was very risky in those days. Um, so I got this Marshall, and uh, uh, I went to LSE because I'd heard that was where you could study left-wing economics. Uh, and, and, and in fact, it was terrible. It was Lionel Robbins. Was, I hadn't done my homework. It was, it was a leg, leftover of a legacy of the, of the 30s. Uh, so I, what I really felt was the, the theories that they were with Williams was working in particular was about American expansionism, and out of that American informal imperialism. And the question that really I didn't understand was economics. Did the system have to expand? And if so, why and how? And there's a lot of rhetoric about that, but I, I wanted to understand the economics of it. So I was reading in London uh, Rosa Luxemburg's in Accumulation of Capital. It's a very big book. Uh, and there were, the introduction to it was written by a woman called uh, Joan Robinson, well-known, later, very you know, eminent Cambridge economist in the left Keynesian perspective, but she'd written stuff that crossed towards Marxism and she was very friendly and open to the, the, the dialogue between Marxism and left Keynesianism. And uh, she was at Cambridge and that's what I wanted to study. So I went up to see Joan. She, she was, saw me, I had a marshal. So she saw me and uh, so I said, this is really what I wanted. We're in the middle of the semester. <laughs> I said, where do I sign up? Cambridge, nobody can get into Cambridge, right? So I'm really intense, how do I get in? How do I? Uh, uh, I talked for about an hour about the economics and why I wanted to understand this and how I didn't understand that. I was kind of, you know, a really eager young man. She picked up the phone, she called uh, a well-known economist, uh, said, Richard, uh, have a, you're a keen American here. Would you admit him to King's tomorrow? <laughs> that was it. <laughs> That's how they do it in England. <laughs> That's how it was done in those days. I don't know if it's done that way. So I did a PhD with Joan Robinson and learned some economics. Amartya Sen was the one year ahead of me, her student as well. I didn't know him very well, but I, I, we were in the same kind of category. So, um, so when I, I also then, I came it beat back between working after working with, I came back to work for um, Bob Kastenmeyer. Uh, he got elected, it must have been 60. And Mark and Dick, Mark Raskin and Dick Barnett had, uh, Mark and Arthur Wasco had been working for Bob Kastenmeyer. Arthur did his PhD at Madison. Mark is from Milwaukee. I'm from Racine. These are all Milwaukee kids, Wisconsin kids. Uh, and they left, and I don't know how it was that they, that Bob got my name. I had, as a student, worked for, uh, had one of these deals with Bill Proxmire, which he had lots of students on his payroll for, you know, about that much money to do research on minor things. And I think his, his AA had been one of my professors. That must have been how it got done. Uh, and I had an internship one summer with Henry Royce, a Wisconsin congressman who was the chairman of the banking committee. So I had a few little tiny connections and so Bob invited me to be his legislative assistant. So I came back from England and um, must be 60, early 61, Kennedy administration, just the beginning of the Kennedy administration.
you were a fairly young woman. What did Washington feel like when you came back? Was that, I mean, did you have a special feeling about it, or were you part of the Kennedy? Well, it was, you know, that's, you know, when I look back on it now, Kennedy was a cold warrior. You yeah. know, it was ridiculous. But he, but he felt very liberating at the time, right? Yeah, it felt like, you know, he had built up this, I met Kennedy once in Wisconsin when he was campaigning, yeah. and he'd built up this vision of young man, active, get the country going, and so forth. And I didn't understand why William Applin Williams said I'm voting for Nixon. And Nixon would have been the better choice because, because uh, Kennedy flagrantly um, did not, you know, built up a whole lie about the missile crisis, that the Russians had more missiles and it was not true. And he, yeah. missile gap, it was not really not true. There was a huge reverse gap. And he stimulated a massive arms race and for political reasons. It was outrageous. Uh, aside from the fact that he probably stole the Illinois, I mean, there's a lot of it, evidence, but that wasn't what bothered me most. They all, Very close vote. Well, there's su substantial evidence that the, you know, the mayor of Chicago was able to control the, the, that number, but, but that's, that wasn't what bothered me now in retrospect. It's the whole Cold War stuff that was outrageous and not necessary. Yeah. And Eisenhower could have spoken out, but he didn't. He could have said, look, we've got the numbers and really, you know, he's a very prestigious figure and he didn't back Nixon. It's, it's, it's a, but Washington felt at that point in time for a fresh young kid from Wisconsin who really wasn't that hip about politics, it felt very exciting. And Mark was very excited about going into the administration, the chart, there was a lot of young people around who felt very, uh, very exciting. So um, that's how, that's, and then, so the next step in the story, just to get the, the chronology right, uh, at the end of, must have been, 62. Yeah, I was with Bob for about two years. I went back to Cambridge literally on the last day of 1962. And I wrote my PhD thesis and came back literally on the last day of 63. Because I got an offer from a job from Gaylord Nelson, the senator who had just been elected as governor, to be his legislative director. So and I met Mark uh, you know, very early in working for Bob Kastenmeyer. And I, you know, I remember asking Marco, "What do you do? <laughs> how do you be a legislative assistant? I don't know how to do this." He said, "Well, you figure out what you want to do, and you make the congressman do it," <laughs> which is typical of Mark. Yeah. <laughs> Both Bob Casimir and Gaylord Nelson hired people who were uh, they they wanted people who would keep pushing. Yeah. They, then they could choose what to do, but they were not. They didn't want passive people. I, I don't know if it was conscious, but they were happy to be nudged and pushed. And you know, they could say yes or no, but. They, they were neither one of them great innovators or creative in their, themselves, but they were what they were able to, they were both of them, Bob was very courageous and Geller was pretty courageous, and they hired people who would, uh, you know, nudge and push and come, come up with ideas. Mark being the most obvious, and then I was the next. I don't know much about what Arthur did at, uh, for Bob, but I think they worked, worked closely with Mark at that time. They were very close friends. Might have been civil rights for them. Before. Might have. Might have. He was. He'd written a really good book on civil rights. Race rights. Too. Yeah. He was. So it might have been that. Um, but I don't remember Bob being doing much about that. So. And Gaylord didn't do much about. It. I don't know. And Kennedy. Didn't. No, and Kennedy didn't either. So that's the. I guess that's the chronology. Because I came back, in very fir the, almost the first day of '64 to work for Gaylord Nelson as legislative direct director. So I had a little staff, and uh, I. So I was there for the Gulf of Tonkin. I was there for the Democratic National Committee meeting in Atlantic City in the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which I was involved with. I was heavily involved in the Gulf of Tonkin crisis issue. Um, and the creation of, of worker-owned uh, of CDCs, Community Development Corporations, was legislation we worked on that is a kind of predecessor of some of the community ownership stuff that I've been doing in other areas since. So that's the... So the beginnings of IPF. So um, I met Mark because he, Mark was the guy who had my job before him. I, mean, I always tease him, I replaced two of you guys, Mark and Arthur. But um, so I got to know Mark very well and be we became very good friends. I, I lived on the same street, on P Street for a while, or, or as Q or Q or P. We both had houses very close to each other. Um, we had kids, my da our daughters were just about the same age, they grew up together. Um, that's Erica, my daughter's Carrie. Uh, so we became. Erica's the doctor. Carrie's the doctor. Carrie. My daughter's a do uh, my, my daughter's a doctor, uh, but Eric, they were very close friends. They're all our friends from way back then. 
Um, and uh, Mark and Dick were the prime developers of, Dick Barnett were the prime developers of, the, of IPS, and they got some, you know, they were recruiting fellow opera people to do it. And uh, was there a, was there a credit? Was there an earlier left think tank or? Is this the first? Uh, Arthur was involved in something called the Peace Research Institute, and so was a guy named. Uh, it, his name will come to me. As, he, he, dis he left the scene, but it'll come to me in a minute. Uh, another guy, and I don't know what they did, but there was some kind of institute. And IPS actually, I think, combined with it or took it over, or it was a very, it was a tiny thing that Mark was, that Dick was involved in. So they recruited me, um, so that's three of us. They recruited Christopher Jenks, who at that time was writing for the New Republic. There was this other guy whose name I'm blocking who didn't, he disappeared very early on. And there was a sixth guy, who was it? I'm blocking, it'll come to me. There were six people. So we'd meet in, most of the time we met in Dick Barnett's living room. And kind of, you know, I, I was not the, I was involved, but it was Mark and Dick were really driving the direction and we were helping if we could. And, Kibitzing and I don't know, trying to think of things to do. Um, to to establish a solid left pro peace institution that would lobby for. Yeah, the well, no, it was actually the the initial conception. What's called Institute for Policy Studies is its name, right? It's not the Institute for Organizing. It was. They thought of themselves, and we thought of ourselves as, on the one hand, coming up with alternative policies to the standard policies. And Dick had written a book about disarmament, disarmament policy, and that's how Mark and Dick met and run disarmament. Um, and you've written a book about the atomic bomb. And I've written a book about atomic bomb, which was you know, about foreign policy and imperial policy and the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, although they were, I think they were recruiting me before that. The, yeah, the Cuban Missile Crisis brought us close to the edge. Yeah, that had happened, and it was Washington-oriented. Um, the sidelight. You, this is a little story which is known in some parts of the world, so you need to. I'll, I'll tag it. Kids used to come in, and during the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, there was something called, uh, let's see, toxin. T O C ring the toxin or strike the toxin at Harvard. It was a predecessor to SDS. Todd Gitlin was one of the people involved. And for some reason they came down, and I was working for Bob Kastenmeyer, and they, they wanted to push the congressman to do more on, I think, nuclear weapons. And uh, so there's two story. One is, I tell you, this is story one. Um, and it give you a sense of the activism. And so I said, you know, push the congressman. Congressmen are, most congressmen are like weather vanes. If you can make the wind blow, they'll go. If, they, if you don't, that was a new idea for them. I said, go back, if you're serious, go back to, to Boston or Cambridge and go organize people and make the wind blow. So <laughs> they did. And they called it Elpervitzing. There's, I am in the dictionary. So they, they used to go door, door to door canvassing mainly. Wow. But they actually did do that. So it's kind of a sign of that what, what kids were willing to do in the 60s, and uh, in particularly in Cambridge. And, and Todd was a different person at those days. He's gotten a little bit more, less, he was more radical in those days. The other one was during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Some of the same kids came down, uh, young girls saying, offering themselves to Kennedy because they'd heard that he liked girls and maybe he would stop the Missile Crisis. <laughs> Story, that gives you the flavor of the culture of 1960s, early. This was an movement. Yeah, but it was early. It was, you know, the, the sexual revolution hadn't really happened yet. And the, it was kind of the, you know, it was half in jest, but not really. They were kind of, you know, we hear this about him. <laughs> it was a different atmosphere. The 60s hadn't happened yet. The 60s happened a little bit later. Um, so that, the Institute was at that point thinking about policy and also very serious, like the, like the, um, the Institute in Germany, which I'm blocking, a um, famous one. It was interested in intellectual development. I mean, really serious about the relationship between politics and, and intellectual development. Early on, was it was the work done collectively, or was 
Mark you know, deciding pretty much direction. It was Dick and Mark deciding direction pretty much, but it, you know, Mark was an anarchist, and neither neither Dick nor Mark could organize anything. They could just I mean, they, that wasn't their style. So, it, but it was, but this, the conception early on was not an activist conception in the way that you think of it now. It was an institute for policy studies, and Eric Fromm was around, Hans Morgenthau was around. Um, let's see, what's, uh, what's a famous woman who, um, uh, the intellectual in, in New York, I'm blocking, they were very well known, Hannah Arendt, um, David Reisman. Uh, there were big names around who were left or left liberal uh, people, Paul Goodman was around a lot. Um, that Mark's conception was that we had, Mark particularly's conception was that it had to be an intellectually serious place, not simply activist. And, and, re, and remember, it's policy oriented at that point. It's pre-civil rights, the civil rights movement, I think, turned it around. Um, but that was the idea, and Mark was able to raise enough money to do that. Mark and Dick together. Mark was a very good fundraiser. Um, was able to do that. But that was a vision, a very different vision. It's like the, the uh, what's the famous German institute? I'm blocking it. Um, no, the, uh, no, the Intellectual Political Institute where, no, it'll come to me. It's, it's uh, anyway, so that was the kind of vision um, that I say Hans Morgenthau would come in and out and people like that would be around. It later became much more activist, but that, that was, when the civil rights movement began and the feminist movement began and the peace movement began. All 65, 63. Yeah, I've, earlier even, 63, 60, I mean, big, big, very early on there were a lot of people that would snick around. Ivanhoe Donaldson was around and there was a whole cadre yeah. and then feminists that were around. Tina Smith was here. Yeah, Tina, Tina was here for a long time. Um, I, like, I particularly liked Tina and we had, uh, she was, and there was, um, so that, developed, but it wasn't the starting point. Yeah. Frankfurter Institute. Yeah, Frankfurt Institute. So that, that was kind of, the, if there's a model, that was the model, more, more than an activist place. So it's changed radically in that sense. In the, and serious theoretical work. Look at Marx's books. Mark, Marx's books were, in, were, were attempts at philosophical theory to underline, underpin a anarchist, anarcho-communal vision, philosophically and culturally. So uh, there was, the argument was that you can't really do serious politics without a much deeper theory. So, did the the growth of the new new left and then civil rights movement push it in a direction more of activism rather than theory? Is that what evolved? How it evolved? Um, activism? Yes and no. Um, civil rights, in particular, was really what you know people got heavily involved in. We, I can talk to you about some of the some of that that I was involved in when I was working in the Senate. But I think what, uh, what really turned the tide uh, was the Vietnam War and the resistance movement and the call to resist. And you know, that, that's, that was really, I think, really the power place of what, and that, I got involved heavily in that as well. Um, but that was, that's where the edge was, I think. I mean, people were, we didn't start with the civil rights movement. People at the Institute, like Mark, Dick, and me, were involved in foreign policy. <laughs> so the war was a big deal, big deal. And I was particularly involved, as I say, in, when I worked in the Senate, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolute, trying to stop it. Um, so. Uh, in terms of uh, Carl Hess's involvement, you mentioned he lived in a, shared a uh, house. Essentially. Yeah, it was, it, by accident, that was when I, I moved on, went to Cambridge, just would come back to study, to start the Cambridge Institute with Christopher Jenks. Um, but I'd come back and for, I can't remember exactly when it was, when I decided to come back more to Washington and keep involved in it. So I needed a place to stay when I was here. And Carl had set up what was called a commune, but basically a, a big house that people had rooms in, but, but shared it. And uh, So Carl, Where was it? It's, uh, it was on, um, I think, Belmont Place in Adams oh. Morgan, Carl Ram Triangle, yeah. Yeah, not far from where I still live. Um, so I lived, you know, we shared the house for a well, while. There were a couple other people that were, they were trying to do, um, you know, fish farming in the basement, and some of that was just starting. On the roof, actually. On the roof was, yeah. there, there was something in the basement, too. There, something, the roof stuff, basement stuff, it was, that was just the beginning of it. 
Huh? Sure. Uh, yeah. I don't know. They, they were doing that, and Carl was doing welding uh, sculptures in those days. I, I loved Carl, but he was the, the most uh, authoritarian anarchist I'd ever met. <laughs> he ran that house with an iron hand. <laughs> so. So, uh, in terms of the transition, uh, as, as uh, civil rights merged into Vietnam and Vietnam merged into more radical forms of opposition to the government. Uh, how did how did your work play out at that point? And when you think in terms of some of the concepts you came up with that led to your work, for instance, in Cleveland, did that start uh, during that period, or is it something that emerged much later? The, uh, there's a couple. Pe there's two or three different pieces there. So um, I think the Cleveland, which is community worker ownership stuff. I think the the origin of that for me was um, living in a kind of a midwestern community, Racine, Wisconsin, which we had a sort of a community spirit. You know, not it wasn't a collective operation. It was a labor town, but more than that, it just had a kind of nice midwestern feel. I still feel that way. They tell me it's changed. Every time I go back, my friends say it's changed a lot. But um, I always tell this story. that It was a place where it was about 75,000, maybe 80,000 people, the industrial town. Uh, and the zoo didn't have an elephant. <laughs> Couldn't afford an elephant. So um, they put up a kind of paper mache elephant with a slot, and people dropped money in it. <laughs> and they got an elephant. <laughs> it's the community some effort of the community got them. That was the spirit of a very kind of low-key, but very friendly community in that sense. That's my memories of it. It may, may well not have been like that. Um, so, and then in the, I think the summer of my freshman year, must have been, might have been my, I went to, uh, took one trip to Europe, you know, with a friend, and we went to Israel for in a week maybe. And I stayed on a kibbutz overnight. And I, my mind, I was blown away by a kibbutz because I had never seen actually a commune that worked. And it was really spectacular, as I remember. It probably wasn't, you know, probably I didn't see the warts, but it was very impressive. So that was an important experience that you could actually do very practical and, and also in many of these cases high tech as well as farming. They were sophisticated operations. And at that moment, we're talking about the 50s, it was a very vibrant movement. It was later to change, and it's changing again. They tell me it's coming back in a different way. But um, it was a, a very uh, I practical idealism. People actually lived interesting and, and fulfilling lives in, in a different way. So I think that was a very significant and reinforced the idea of community in some sense. And then in the Senate, I was working on community development corporations. Now, what was that? You draw a circle around a neighborhood, and the neighborhood should own the industry. So, I mean, I, the, the logic of the, the design has some interesting implications. Very American. Maybe there would be something that was practical. And also, uh, you know, state socialism, I don't know when I began to think about it, but state socialism has got, you know, it, it has major, major problems. It's authority. I mean, centralize all that power in the state because it owns the industry. There's, and the, any practical or theoretical level, that's mo monstrous possibilities there. So if you don't like capitalism, you don't like socialism, what is the model? And, and you begin to look for decentralized forms, one of which is neighborhood or community. But the work that Neil Selman was doing, David Morris, Carl Hess, that had little to do with some of the development of those theories. Yeah, they, they were... Um, now, at that point, they were doing more practical technology stuff. They were interested in agri fish farming and wind and things that became very popular later. They weren't particularly oriented to political economic structure, which is the systemic design. Who owns the industry? How do you relate to politics? What's the cultural design? And I think a lot about it. systemic architecture. You know, what is, what is the arrangement of the institutions and what, what are the outcomes of the arrangements. Uh, so state socialism powers the state, but corporate capitalism powers the corporations and the state. I mean, and anarchy. There's a lot of real intellectual questions 
that you need to grab, and that's what I was interested in. They were, Carl was an anarchist. He didn't really have a theory except, you know, no, get rid of the state. Uh, there are some anarchists who have theories, but Carl didn't. That was not the discussion of those days. The discussion was, in that group, was about neighborhood technology, which was an important discussion, but it's a different one. So um, I'm not sure where we, where we were. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, I got to the community ownership, I think, and then I ran into Jeff Foe, who was in the government working in what was called OEO, the Office of Economic Opportunity the Poverty Program. Was it 68? No, much earlier, 64, maybe 60, yeah, 64 probably, or 65. And he was in charge of, within the government, of setting up or financing and developing community development corporations. Bedford Stuyvesant Corporation was one of his, in his menu of activities. So he was working on this from the inside uh, in a very practical, community development corporations in the early versions, they, not, they turned out later to be simply nonprofits to help in housing and small business development. In the early versions, they were setting up community owned industry and community owned businesses. Maybe, I don't know. Yeah. But they were much more interesting structurally. And there are a couple of them. There's one down, New, New Communities, Inc., which is one that's left like that, which there are a few remnants of that period that actually had ownership for the, to benefit the community. So it's a, that structure is sort of like the primitive structure of the, either the kibbutz, or, which is community ownership, but much more advanced socially and culturally. But there's a fragment of overlap uh, and it's a decentralized socialist model, if you, you know, in some form, a cooperative social, that is geographic community with ownership of, bin, of some kind of industry to benefit the whole community. That's micro-socialism. Uh, so it was very interesting intellectually, the, the development. They didn't think of it that way. They thought of, what, you know, how do you improve the, the neighborhood? But I saw it as a different way, and as you could do practical things. We later wrote legislation, a guy named John McClory, was conservative, very conservative, but 17th century conservative, not current conservative. He believed in small communities, believed in Vermont vote, towns and voting. He and I wrote legislation which, if enacted, and it had a chance, uh, we, we got, w would have filled the country with community-owned industry. It was called the Community Self-Determination Act. And we got so I was working in the Senate, we got, uh, it was after the Senate, but we met in the Senate. We got, we got it into both the House and, we got it into both the Democratic and Republican platforms in 1968, and we got uh, legislation introduced by 33 senators, half Republicans, half Democrats, uh, to do this. And so that was an era where you could actually maybe even think about ha making it happen. And model cities did not incorporate any of that. No, this 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 was this would have been a banking system and a high, it would have been tax bills. It would have done massive stuff. It got later. It has a, I just learned some history of it because it got tarred with a, it was a very interesting piece of legislation. It got tarred with the brush of the guy who took over core from a guy named McKissick. McKissick, but no, his successor, a guy named Roy Innes, Innes. Oh, okay. who was pretty much a thug. And since CORE was backing it, and since the Nixon administration was willing to think about it, it got tarred with that brush. But you know, there's a whole revisionist history looking at what this would have done if we could have pulled it off. And it would have been really, leaving aside the names and the, the politics that got associated with it. There's a historian working on this now who came by to do an interview. And she's talking about how the, the, how the stuff was, that was, was tarred with the Innis brush. But it was viable at that moment because the Republicans were looking for maybe getting some black votes and the Democrats wanted to have community development, so it was interesting. Um, so that's kind of where I have got involved in. And the transition town, transition city movements? Uh, not, 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 not at all. Not at that point. I that, mean, but you don't see the relationships with that in the last six or seven years. Uh, transition towns, to my knowledge, and I'm not you know, perfectly knowledgeable, have not really gone in the direction of common ownership. This was, the, the, the hallmark here is changing who gets to own the capital. 
they've done some really interesting things, but I, that has not been a key characteristic, uh, so far as I'm aware. Alternative capital. Yeah, but usually it's private businesses, um, and that's this is not that. This is different. Now the development of state banks. Twenty now, yeah. Twenty, yep. including Maryland. Yeah. Looking into that, does that tie into? Yeah, you. I got very interested. Um, I mean, that takes us a little beyond this point. If we're going. Yeah, probably. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. but yes, that's very interesting. Uh, um, the uh, public banks are part of this story, which and the, I, I wrote an essay in. Again, a little bit past this date, which, which was called "Notes Towards a Pluralist Commonwealth." Must have been 1972. Then later published it in a book called Strategy and Program, where Stoughton Lynn did an essay on politics, and, I, and this this was an essay on structure, uh, which kind of laid out a vision that begins with plural forms of ownership, pluralist common wealth, so neighborhood corporations, ge geographic, uh, worker owned is worker owned. Uh, city-owned, municipal, state banks is another one, regional like the Tennessee Valley Authority, nationalized some, ba some banks are, well, plural, it's a structural design that is plural in its structures with a view to breaking up power but also making it common in its direction. So that was, I think, 1972. So what is that, 40 years ago, something like that. Um, so I've been, th I've been thinking, to me, I don't know when it, became my problem, but it did become my problem. If you don't like capitalism, you don't like socialism, what is your design? What is it you want? And I, for some reason, that, that has been a, uh, that's been a guiding question for me. And I, and I also think you can't really move a good politics unless you have a direction, direction that's clarified. And it makes sense. Uh, does it make sense? Will it work? And why would you want to do that if it didn't? So I have thought a lot, you know, but a lot of experiments like the CDC movement in its early phase were really interesting from that point of view. I'm interested in the career of Maryland and being that we're in a time of perceived darkness, some thoughts you have about a way out of the darkness, so what a, vis a hopeful vision in terms of the vision of the 60s and 70s and how we could translate to some hope for those of us on the left. I'd be interested in to hear thoughts about that, but we could proceed as long as we can keep a few minutes for that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm at your service. Well, <laughs> Whatever you want. Are you okay with that? Or? Yes, we're all led to. We're led to where you yeah. are now. Yeah, but you're about to yeah. Yeah, you know, fire from the University of Maryland. Yeah, the, the, I mean, you know, I should, you know, I wrote a book in the middle of this on the bombing of Hiroshima, mm -hmm. which became a really big book, very highly debated. And that book drove me to another question, which is the sources of imperialism. We were talking about that earlier. And so a lot of this is also what, what is the nature of a systemic design that does not have to expand as, corporate, as capitalist systems must expand, otherwise they don't work. So that's a big part of this. I, I, you know, knowing what happened in Hiroshima, which was totally unnecessary and known to be unnecessary, and blew away 300,000 people you know, mostly civilians, mostly old people and kids. So where did, what is a culture that made that possible? So that's a whole part of this that for me, a uh, very important part of it. Um, and I was involved, we're gonna, given the time availability, I was heavily involved and in, I, I did some things with Martin Luther King and I did things at the Atlantic City um, 1964 convention with the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. I went down to Mississippi as a Senate aide, went around the state with Bob Moses, the whole, story about that, and I did things with King that start on his very first efforts against the anti-war movement in 1967. And then I became a Washington liberal left economic figure, because the press picked up on the economics we were doing for, in the Carter administration. I was, very, I was very well known because we were doing progressive economics, and I was kind of a Paul Krugman, Dean Baker kind of figure in, the, in that period. Meet the, I was on Meet the Press, that, that, and, and Charlie Rose, and all those things on that during that period. But that's another story from the period you're, you want to talk about. Uh, and I was in Cambridge. We moved to Cambridge, and I came back to Washington. We set up the Cambridge Institute, Christopher Jenks and I, and, which was interested in all this stuff and regional 
how do you do regions and how do you do, I think we published the first worker-owned comp, worker-owned modern worker ownership book. Um, and then we set up, Jeff Foe and I set up the Exploratory Project for Economic Alternatives, which is doing the same thing in another name, which became the National Center for Economic Alternatives. We did stuff with the Youngstown Steel Workers, et cetera, et cetera, all flowing from this. It's a long story. <laughs> you don't want to hear the long story, but that's probably beyond your period, I guess. Um, did you want? Did you want to spend time in the modern period, or? Well, I think it would be fitting. To, yeah, to, maybe five update, minutes of kind of summing up what yeah, you feel like you've, you've learned from all this. Right? Visions of hope for the future, yeah. based on your experience with the past and what you tried to do in your lifetime. Well, the you know the and also the Maryland. Maryland was there was not a problem. The University of Maryland. Um, we moved essentially the explore. The National Center for Economic Alternatives moved into the university and changed its name, and other people were brought in. There was a point where the university was, uh, it was a high point in the university money was around, and we were doing creative things, and uh, so we set up, they recruited me, and uh, then we recruited a guy named Benjamin Barber, who's a well-known political scientist, works in neighborhood stuff or, or cities, he wrote a very good book called uh, it was about strong cities, strong democracy. Um, and we set up a, 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 a kind of the democracy collaborative. It later turned out everybody, for one reason or another, Ben moved out of town, another guy went to Brookings, another guy, a woman died. So, but so Ted Howard and I basically ran this. We brought a woman named Jessica Nemhard Gordon, who's now just written a wonderful book on black, the history of black co-ops. I brought her to Maryland. I mean, I met Ger I, I've been working on this stuff for so long. I've, I met her for the first time, and I remember saying, I said, Jessica, black woman working on co-ops, intellectual, doing actually all this work. I've been looking for her for 30 years, and an economist. <laughs> it's true, I did. I was so excited to meet her. So she came, to, we brought her to Maryland to be part of this. Uh, it was not, this, there was no political problem. It didn't have any political overtones at the university. It was fine, it was good, it's a new area. They thought we were interesting people, and so that was, there wasn't a problem about conservative or liberal. Um, and that, that, but it, there was a later problem, which is, I guess, university politics. The president, the dean, the chair of the department, and the provost at that point in time were pretty progressive. Over the years, every one of them changed, and they all changed to the right. So we basically lost the institutional real support in, for, in, that, in, in that setting. But that's typical of universities. And, and the state got involved in the process. Yeah, but it didn't affect us. It's just that the budgets got shorter. We, were hap we happened to come in when there was a budget surplus. I mean, a very unusual moment. The things were really hot. Well, when was that moment? That was... Uh, in the 90s? Yeah, yeah, it was in the there was 90s. There was a lot of money around. There was a lot of money around, and they were looking for creative things. And all the, the, the politics within the university changed just changed, it had nothing to do with us, but it changed for the, the appointments that were made, and the money changed. So um, anyway, that, that meant we had to raise our own money if we want to do interesting things. Again, anyway, if you really want to do interesting things, you always have to raise your own money. I learned that from Mark, <laughs> Mark Raskin. Visions for the future, in terms of your life's work. We're in a, a period of reasonable or unreasonable darkness. Cantor uh, has just been voted out of office. Uh, there, there's lots of feeling of a resurgence of Tea Party politics, um, and uh, people are anticipating a loss, Democratic loss, of leadership in the Senate. Uh, can you tie any of this into your life's work in terms of something you'd want to point to in terms of uh, public policy changes, political sure. changes? So um, I think this, this is, just for openers, I think this is the most interesting and important period of American history, bar none. I include the Revolution and the Civil War. So uh, that's for openers. <laughs> I think the, uh, the system is in dead stalemate. At the political level, it's in stagnation at the economic level. Uh, and unlike earlier periods, there is not going to be a massive war to pull it out of stagnation. I think that's over, which is really important. 
So I think we're into decay, stagnation, stalemate, and decay. I mean, you can't have a bland war in Europe or Asia because of nuclear weapons, which is how they, that was mid-century. And, you know, even small wars are diminishing in public support, and they don't cost enough to stimulate the economy. So, and yet the economy is not collapsing because the government is, used, you know, used to, in 1929 it was 11% of the economy, now it's 32, 34. So stalemate, stagnation, and decay rather than Marxist collapse, or which the right would have taken over, probably not the left in any case. In that context, which is very painful and pessimistic if you look at one level, people are really being forced to do interesting things. And we're in touch with that, the new economy movement. And the press doesn't, cannot cover it. It doesn't have any money at the local level. There, there aren't any reporters who cover local stuff, and I'm exaggerating. And the con papers are conservative, the ones that are left. So you can't see it. But if you, the work we do, we see it because we research it. We're in networks and online. There's an explosion of stuff in, going on around the country. Hundreds, maybe thousands of experiments with co-ops and worker-owned co stuff and land trusts and, and the new economy movement is developed. And there's even, they even see it, now are self-identifying. They begin to call themselves a movement. There was a conference last weekend that I spoke at uh, in Boston, which in came yeah, in Boston. There were 700 people there uh, studying, we're, we're activists, environmentalists, who are really in, in motion. You were there too. And, uh, no, there's a, and there's one this weekend in, in Oakland for the Bali conference, which will be another 700, maybe 1,000 people. Something has happened. We've been seeing the experiments because we, we look at all this worker owned stuff and communities and co ops, and we see all that developing, but there's a flip in consciousness that younger people are beginning to say, hey, there's something out here we could do. And that's a big change. I, you know, I've been waiting a long time for that. So it's, um, we'll see what happens, but what's forcing it is pain and the dead end of alternatives at the national level. There is no choice. You either get, situations get worse or you build something new. And I think that's just beginning to dawn. So I see this, and it, when it, and it involves a combination of ec ecological interest and environmental concern and shifting ownership to a, some form of democratic form. That's the mix, and that's where the action is. So uh, if that continues in the way it's going, and I think it will because it's so, so much pain on the ground and because there's a lot of not practical experiments. You can do, you can do what we're doing in Cleveland. You can look around the country all over. There are models that somebody else did it. You could probably do it. As soon as that's real, then it's your problem. You cannot say it can't be done. Now, you've been doing farm stuff for a long time, and people are now beginning to do that again. They're catching on, starting up. So it's a, and I think the dead end at the national level is likely to continue and continue to force this, force this. It's whether or not, you know, th those are the ingredients potentially of a very exciting and potentially important period of history. Now, you don't, you know, you don't want, you're talking about changing the system. You're talking 30, you've got to play, put a few decades on the table. We'll see where this develops. And the, another level, the idea system, people are beginning to talk about theories of change and theories of ideas. I've been writing about, a lot about, what is the model that might actually, I call it, in, that might actually deal with community building up, but, but also deal with planning and be sophisticated and deal with large scale industry and some of it's in the last couple of books and some of it's in that website I mentioned. But other people are doing that. And a guy named Gus Speth, I don't know if that's a name people don't, James Gus of Speth is doing something with me. Uh, we've launched something called the Next System Project. Now, it, so here's just at another level of consciousness shifts. Gus is a guy who was a chief economic advisor to Carter and Clinton, who was head of the UNDP and was dean of the Yale Environment School, total insider. And he's flipped. He now knows that the system has to be changed or you can't deal with the environmental trends. So he's talking, writing books about with me and we're doing this project and we're launching it. It's got the President of the Political Science Association, the Academy of Management, it's the American Sociological Association. Those are saying it's the system's the problem. We now have to talk about systemic change. Those are evidence that there's some consciousness shifting. So in launching a debate about what it looks like. Uh, that's a really important moment in history when you can begin to open these questions with that level of people. I was, last summer, the, so here's another sign of the times, that, that 
I read it. As a historian, I read these as shifting culture and shifting consciousness. The Academy of Management is 29,000 business school professors and corporate advisors, not your left-wing group. Their conference last summer, and they asked me to be one of the keynotes, the subject of the conference is, is capitalism over? And if so, what do we do about it? The same thing said by the head of Davos. There's awareness that there's a systemic crisis. That's the first time in modern history that there's awareness that it's not just who you elect, that there's an underlying crisis. So these little models that we're talking about, which are transformed, whether or not they generate architectural principles for larger scale is one of the interesting questions. Whether you can build a serious movement rather than a kind of, kind of flaky movement, whether it has ideas, whether it has content, and state, you know, so you talk about state banking. Uh, my friend Ellen Brown just ran for treasurer in the state of California on a state banking. She got 200,000 votes. Where did that happen from? Uh, for public owned bank in the state. So there's, I mean, I could go on because we cover this stuff, but there are just many, many signs that, put, that there are elements of active agree, interest and new ideas coming out of the dead end, coming out of the pain. So um, it is possible, you know, it's, it's possible that nothing will happen. It's possible it will get violence and fascism. But it's also possible that we may be laying groundwork, both intellectual and practical, and political for building up over time a, a powerful movement. Uh, move, you know, the Berlin Wall did fall, Soviet communism did fall, the apartheid did fall, and we did, you know, the farmers and, and merchants, little, little farmers and merchants took on the British Empire and knocked it off in the American. Things are not, I'm not, a, I'm not a utopian optimist, but I am not by any means willing to succumb to um, uh, easy pessimism. You know, the, uh, <laughs> I, I tease sometimes. I'm from Wisconsin, so I grew up in the McCarthy era with Joe, Joe McCarthy, yeah, right. senator. our senator. Nationally, nobody, everyone was scared stiff. In Wisconsin, it was double because he was right there. They shot anything that moved. And so I, 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 this is my story about pessimism. If you lived in Wisconsin in the 1960s, you knew nothing could be done. Joe McCarthy was everywhere. My high school teachers were like this. You might say something wrong in class and be reported, and that was it, your job. A lot of, actually, a lot of McCarthyism took place at the schools. It's all, everybody thinks about the national stuff, but the schools, they were after all that. So you knew that nothing could change. This is the late 1950s. So what happened? The 60s exploded, totally unpredicted. It's a very big mistake to, to um, you need to be cautious about it. I'm not a utopian, but I'm also very careful about saying the, what you see is what you get. The, you know, the other guys to look at is the, Repub the conservatives in the United States in the 1940s. They were minuscule in their power, and they were very determined about building power. Now, they had corporations to back them, but they were, they were very serious about building political power. So I think this is a really interesting period of time. I think we've run out of the traditional liberal option, which is you know, let the corporations have the ownership and try to, try to keep them in line. I think that's over. That depended upon having labor unions politically, and I think that's over, so I think that option isn't going to play. Where the action is is in the kind of stuff that's being experimented with, and it's really interesting action. More so here than in Germany. Yeah, yeah it's, it drives my European friends crazy. I say, we're way ahead of you precisely because we have such a weak social democracy. You're using social democracy, and that, it's better to have people who aren't in pain, and social democrats can help you with that. So I'm not against doing whatever liberals can do. I'm for that. But the fact that it's in such stalemate and we have such a weak labor movement to, to back the traditional social democratic liberal model means that we are forced to experiment faster than, than you guys over there. And so we may be ahead. We may be surprisingly ahead of you. And we also have decentralist traditions. You know, community ideas is, we're not the centralized France. We, you, you can build from the bottom in America in a way that it really doesn't fit most of the European models in, in a sense. So I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm not a utopian optimist, but I am by no means a pessimist either. I, I think pe easy pessimism is too cheap. Uh, we'll see.